welcome to this video all about the Azure Role-Based Access Control, which initially doesn't sound that exciting, but it's actually some pretty cool stuff we can do. And this essentially boils down to giving something, that that something could be a user, it could be a group, it could be an application, a set of permissions, i.e. things it can do, at a certain scope, could be a subscription, could be a resource group, could be higher up, management group. Ideally, when needed, i.e. just in time. For the permissions, we think just enough. And there are many different aspects to what is a fairly simple statement. So my goal for this video is to really walk through what are resource providers, resources, actions, and roles in Azure Resource Manager, understanding how we organize resources in Azure, when we think about, hey, the scope, what are the types of security principle we have in Azure Active Directory? Azure Active Directory is the identity provider that Azure is going to use. What are my role-based access control capabilities in Azure? How I can use custom roles? Thinking about just-in-time access using the privileged identity management feature of Azure Active Directory and Azure Resource Manager. And then finally, what can we do about actually locking Azure resources, trying to protect them maybe from update, maybe just protecting them from deletion? Now, when I think about resources in the Azure Resource Manager, and that's what I'm gonna focus on. Now, in the past, there were things like Azure Service Manager that didn't have role-based access control. It was kind of that V1. Well, we're focusing on V2. Now, in ARM, we have resource providers. They provide all of the resources available within a subscription. So if I was to go ahead and look at my subscription, I would see various resource providers. So right now in my subscription, I can go to subscriptions. I can pick one. And if I scroll down, I'm gonna see my resource providers. Now, many of these are just automatically registered. Some of them will register when I try and use certain types of resource. Others, I can go ahead and actually register when they're required. Now, whether that resource provider is automatically registered or if you manually register it, it's defining the resources that I can use. For example, a virtual machine, a virtual machine scale set, a storage account, a managed disk, a virtual network. These are all types of resource that are defined within a resource provider. Now, additionally, we think about there are actions that I can use for different types of resource, and the resource provider defines those actions. Now, some types of action will work for any type of resource. For example, read, write, delete. They're very standard. They're gonna work across different types. Others are very specific. For example, run command extension. Well, that's gonna be very specific to a virtual machine. It wouldn't apply to a storage account. But the resource provider describes all of those applicable actions for each type of resource. Now, I don't want to try and assign a user or a group or an application individual actions. Instead, we group them into roles. And there are a number of built-in roles that really gather the most common configurations of actions that I want to use. For example, an, an owner, a virtual machine contributor, a virtual network contributor. And in that role, it has all of those core actions required to meet that type of job. Now, if we jump over to the portal for a second, if I actually go and look at access control, I can look at all of the different roles that are available. Now I'm looking at a subscription. If I was looking at a management group, if I was looking at a resource group, I see all of the types of roles that are available. This is because within a management group, a subscription, a resource group, I can really have any type of resource. If I was to go and look at a virtual machine, 
Well, I would only see the roles that apply to that type of resource. It would scope down the roles that I can see. But let's just pick one of these kind of built-in roles. You can see all these are built-in. There are some custom ones as well. But for right now, we can just go and let's say a networking one. And all the way at the top, because it's one of the ones I've actually used, we can see network contributor. Now if I select this and then select permissions, it will show me, well, which resource providers have any actions assigned to this role? So I can see, well, from the network resource provider, at the management plane, remember we have a management plane, that's really the Azure Resource Manager. Then we have a data plane. The data plane would be things actually living within the resource. So for example, if it was a storage account, the management plane would enable kind of the creation of a storage account. Um, it would enable getting the access keys. But to actually write a blob, that's an action on the data plane. And so with these roles, I can also interact with the data plane for some of the types of resource. If I was to look at the network resource provider, well, here we can see all of the types of resource that exists within that resource provider and the permissions that this role has been given. You can see these ticks. And it's got those very generic ones at the top. So I can see, well, there's read, write, delete, and then there's other. So if I scroll down, let's take a look actually at virtual network. So we can see there's the gateway, virtual network subnet, and then virtual network itself. If I select it, then I can see the more specific permissions. And here we can see, well, look, there is, we'll get Bastion host, join virtual network, join a load balancer to virtual network, and then peer virtual networks. If you click the little I, you can see the actual exact name of the action. And there are kind of child resource types for virtual network. So you can see there's huge amounts of granularity that's actually possible here. And these built-in roles gather the most common ones that we want to think about. As a quick note, Azure AD has its own separate set of permissions, its own separate set of roles. They are completely different from Azure Resource Manager. They don't really tend to interact other than if I am a global administrator in Azure AD, I have the ability to kind of turn on this management of management groups and subscriptions. That gives me this special role called User Access Administrator, which lets me then change the permissions on management groups and subscriptions that trust my Azure AD tenant. It's kind of a break glass that I can change the permissions on anything I want to. I have to elevate up and then I can do that. If I quickly jump over, if we actually go and look at our Azure Active Directory, I am a global administrator. So one of the things I can actually do is kind of under the management, if I go to properties, if I scroll all the way to the bottom, you can see, hey, look, access management for Azure resources. So I've got this set to yes. Ideally, you would only set that to yes when you're doing something and then turn it off again. But what this does is if we were actually to go and look at any of our subscriptions and look at the access control and look at role assignments, what you'll actually see is this user access administrator and there I am. So that's been set at the root level and that enables me if I want to, to change the permissions on anything. So in a worst case, if I was to get locked out of a subscription, I can actually elevate myself up because I'm a GA and change those permissions. So now let's think about the actual organization of resources. So we've looked at, well, the permissions. Now, what is the scope I can assign them at. So I have an Azure AD instance. That's for my organization. I have a certain tenant. In my case, it's SavileTech.net. Now, underneath that, by default, there is a root management group. So management group is something we can use for access control. It can be used for 
policy. It can be used for budgets. And I can create a whole hierarchy. So this management group hierarchy will map whatever you want to do in terms of your management structure, be it policy application, be it access control, be it budgets. And then I have subscriptions under those management groups. And of course, it's in those subscriptions we actually create things. And once again, at a subscription, I can assign access control and policy and budgets. Within the subscriptions, we can create one or more resource groups. And once again, I can assign permissions. I can do policy and budgets. And then we put resources inside them. So any of these constructs, I can actually set as the scope for a role. Now we wanna stay well away from assigning roles directly to resources. Um, certain types of automation might do that. But for us to manually manage that is very, very difficult. We want to think about, well, we're going to group like resources together for a project, for an application in a resource group. And typically we'll want common permissions over those things. So a resource group is probably as low as we'll ever go for the scope of a role assignment to users or groups. Now it might be they all need the same permission across a subscription. Great. It might be either a central monitoring team or a central network team who need a certain role across all subscriptions. Well, great, I can set that at a certain point in the management group hierarchy. But this is where I can set the scope of what those permissions are actually going to be. And then, who are we giving it to? All of the identities have some kind of object in Azure Active Directory. Now, most obvious would be a user. This could be a cloud account, i.e. they're actually created directly in Azure AD. More likely for most organizations that have Active Directory, they're gonna be synchronized, replicated from Active Directory using Azure AD Connect. It could be a guest user. This is also known as a B2B user. It's someone from another Azure AD. It's someone with a Microsoft account. It's someone with a Gmail account. It's someone that was connected via WS Fed or SAML Federation. Or if it's none of those, they get sent a one-time passcode in their email. But it's someone else outside of my organization. It could be a service principle, i.e. an application that I have registered to my Azure AD. And it's gonna authenticate either with a secret or a certificate. So when we have applications, they really have kind of two personas. There's an application object that represents the app globally. And then for any Azure AD tenant that uses that app, well then it gets a service principle within that tenant. So we're gonna have a secret or a certificate for that application to authenticate using that service principle. We can have managed identities. A managed identity is where we kind of can flip a switch and our virtual machines, our containers, our whatever it might be, can actually get an identity in Azure AD that represents that particular resource. And only that resource can act as that identity if it's system managed. If it's user assigned, then multiple resources can act at it but it's another type of identity that's inherent to Azure Resource Manager. And then of course, I can have groups. They contain the above. So they're all the types of security principles that we're gonna give these roles to at a certain scope. Now remember, if I want, I can use conditional access to the Microsoft Azure Management application to control that access. So for example, the portal, the PowerShell, the CLI, the APIs, they all fall under that Microsoft Azure Management application. So if I wanted to say, hey look, before you can use the portal, you must be on a managed device. You must be healthy. Maybe you have to be this location, you have to have MFA'd. I could use conditional access to drive that requirement. 
But essentially, all of the things we just talked about, what do they do? Well, I'm going to have a certain principle, in this case a group, assigned at a certain scope a certain role. So let's just kind of look at that quickly. So if we jump over again, and I'm going to go a level up. So if we look at management groups, what I've actually done here is you can see I have a hierarchy. So there's the root. Then I've created one called all Savile Tech subscriptions that I have two subscriptions under. Then there were child management groups of all Savile Tech subscriptions. But if I look at this all Savile Tech subscriptions management group and go to access control, note I can also assign policies and budgets. If we go to the access control for my role assignments, I gave Diana Prince network contributor role. So that's where this was assigned. Now, if I go and look at one of the subscriptions that's under that management group and look at access control, well, guess what? We'll find Diana is a network contributor. It was inherited from the management group. If I was to go and look at an individual resource group, if I was to go and look at an actual virtual network directly, well, guess what? We're going to see that inherited through. So there we go. So that's the key point. I assign at a scope. It is inherited down. So now Diana has this network contributor role at any resource that's under that scope point. So because I set it at a management group, all child management groups, all child subscriptions, all contained resource groups, and then all resources within those, Diana has that right, I network contributor. So the security principle was Diana, the role was network contributor, and then the scope was a management group. And of course, we can actually go and dive in. That's obviously not working very well. But if we went and looked actually at the roles, we would see what those permissions actually were. And that's what we kind of walked through before. So network contributor, we can look at the permissions. And it was based on all of those resource providers. Make sure when you're assigning these roles, we think least privilege. We want to give people just enough to do the job but not more. If you find the built-in roles don't really get you exactly what you want, then we need to think about it another way. We need to do something else. Don't give them more than what they need. What this means is custom roles. So the built-in roles don't meet my requirements, then I can create custom Azure Resource Manager roles. And essentially, we're just going to take those actions that are defined in the resource provider and gather them together in our own package with its own name. Now, the built-in roles are just available globally through every tenant, every subscription. We don't have that permission. I can't add a new role to Azure, nor would I really want to. So when we create our own roles, we configure an assignable scope. This could be one or more subscriptions. This could be one or more management groups. And note, it's also possible to actually create custom Azure AD roles as well. So if I jump over for a second, if I think about for a second, you can see here, look, this was a virtual network, but we'll actually go back, and let's say just look at a subscription if I go to the access control and look at the roles, well, you'll actually notice if I go to custom, I already have a couple. I created one just for network peering target that has a single permission in it. I created another one that lets me just read virtual machines and use the run command extension. Now, when you add these, you can add a role assignment or I can add a custom role. And it will actually go through, let me give a name. I can clone an existing role. So I can pick an existing role and it will copy those permissions over. And then I can add and remove as I see fit. Or I can just start completely from scratch. 
I can also start from a JSON file. So if I just type in test, for example, and click next, well, now I can add permissions. I can search for certain permissions. If I search for peer, it will find me permissions based around peer. So adding peering services, etc. So I would build up that new role. I'm not going to create it through the portal. That's not great from a change control perspective from repeatability. Now, I can also create them from CLI, from PowerShell. Now, one of the nice things I can do from PowerShell is quickly dump out all of the role definitions. I'm going to format it as a table. So if I run this, I can see all of the different roles. I could then look at one specific role. In this case, my custom network peering role. You can see it's showing me the assignable scopes. I could actually go and look at the actions. You can see in this case, it's the Microsoft.network virtual networks peer slash action. But I could then take that output and just convert it to JSON. And what I would actually do is I could take that now, store it as a JSON file and modify it. So if I exported out an existing role that's close to what I want to do, I would put null in for the ID, change the name, set is custom to true, add a description, and then change the actions. And then for the assignable scopes, I would put in my subscription ID, or I can actually use multiple subscriptions. I could put in a management group or multiple management groups. So I would set what my scope is. Once I've got the JSON file just how I want it, I would create a new role definition using that JSON file. Here's my other custom role. Again, I have two actions. I want to be able to read only virtual machines so I could find them from an Azure resource graph query. Then I want to be able to use the run command extension. So create custom roles if you need to. You don't want to create more than you have to. But if a role doesn't meet the requirements, you can create a custom role. You set the assignable scopes where you want to be able to use it. And then you can grant people that role. You're not giving them more than what they actually need. Now, the next part beyond giving them more than what they need is giving it to them only when they actually need a certain set of permissions. So roles ensure we give them the privileges required, just enough. And typically, we're not using them all the time. We do a certain activity that requires those elevated permissions. And so ideally, we don't want to let them have the permissions all the time. They can accidentally do bad things. And if they're elevated, those bad things can be far more severe. If they were compromised in some way, it's better to have a more minimal set of permissions that they have to elevate up to maybe requiring additional strong authentication like MFA. And so PIM, Privileged Identity Management, enables this elevation for both Azure AD roles and ARM roles as required. I can have things like optional approval. I can have maybe a ticket number has to be entered, a comment has to be entered. So this is giving me that just-in-time capability. Now, the elevation can include an MFA stronger authentication requirement. For many of the Azure AD roles, you can't turn that off. Now, if I authenticated already with a strong authentication, I don't have to MFA again. But if I didn't, it will make me MFA. For the Azure Resource Manager roles, I can configure, hey, look, do I want that kind of stronger authentication if I didn't already have that in my token? Now, this does require an Azure AD Premium P2 license. That's available as part of a number of additional SKUs like the E5 flavors. Note, this does not extend to Active Directory resources. That has its own kind of um, elevation capability, the privileged access management. So PIM is just for things tied into Azure AD. If I jump over, if I actually go and look at the privileged identity management, you'll see I can actually look at the Azure AD roles 
and I can look at Azure resources. So we care about Azure resources. Now, before I can use this, I have to go and discover resources. This enables them to actually be managed by PIM and you'll see it actually creates an account with the same permissions as a global administrator that elevated. It lets them change these permissions. So I've run that discovery already and I can see both of my subscriptions. So what we then do is select the target I want to assign a role at. So I could do this at management group levels, subscriptions. I could do it at a particular resource group, for example. So if I just select resource groups, I'll see all of my resource groups. And then from here, I could actually go and grant a certain role. So I can see here as management central US. And then from here, I can go and set the configurations for all the various roles. And as part of these configurations, if I hit edit, then I can see, well, I have the activation actually performing that elevation to get this role. And I can say if I require MFA or not, how long it lasts for, justification tickets required approvers. And then actually the assignment of this right to elevate, well, how long does this eligible assignment last for? It expires after a certain amount of time. Can I make it a permanent eligible so it never expires? Can I just make it a permanent active assignment so they don't have to elevate at all, but then make that assignment expire after a period of time? And then what notifications are going to happen during activation, assignment, etc. So I have all these configurations that I can actually do. And I'm going to assign them. So in this case, for the contributor role at this scope, i.e. this resource group, Clark Kent has that ability to elevate up. So I have assigned them that ability. So if I was to jump over for a second, so if I'm now Clark Kent and I go to that resource group, if I look at the access control, look at my role assignments, well, I'm not in there as a contributor. I mean, there was a network contributor. I mean, there was a reader, but I don't have that right. So let's kind of test, well, what can I do? If I go and look at the resources, well, what do we have in here? Well, we have a storage account. Now, if I look at this storage account, I have reader rights so I can see the things. I can look at the containers within there and I'm accessing notice using my Azure AD user account. And I can select one of these things. I would be able to download it because I'm a reader. I'm actually tricking you. Reader would not give me access to the data. The reason Clark can read the data is because if I look at the access control, remember there was the management plane and the data plane. Clark actually has storage blob data reader at the data plane level. That's why he can read the data. However, what we can test is, well, look, I'm accessing it as the Azure AD user account. But if I switch to the access key, I can't. I don't have permission to look at the access keys. So let's go to PIM as this user. And what I can see are my roles. So I'm eligible to activate upwards. So I go to my Azure resources. I can see I can go to contributor for the management resource group and I'm gonna activate. It's checking my request. I could set an activation time in the future. I can set a duration, um, want to access keys and I'm gonna activate and that would now be logged. Now it's gonna tell me I have to log out. That's the safest thing to do, refresh token, etc., etc. But I shouldn't need to actually do that for what we're testing. So that's now complete. If we now go back again and look at that storage account and we'll go down and we'll look at our containers again, we'll go to images again. It's using my Azure AD user account. Now we'll try to switch to access key. It's saying access denied but let's actually try a refresh of this. 
make it actually reload. And now it's working. So now I can access the access key because I've done that elevation. If I look at the access control, role assignments, now you'll actually see, look, I am a contributor. It's been added in at the resource group level that has been inherited. If I finish my tasks early, I can go and look at my roles. I can look at my Azure resources, look at my active roles, and I can say, hey, look, this activated one, I don't need it anymore. I'll deactivate. It's now removed that role. Again, we'll refresh just to make sure. Go back to that storage account. And actually, we just try and test it directly on the access control. Role assignments. I've gone as a contributor. If I go and access the access keys, it doesn't let me. So that is PIM. And I definitely recommend you use PIM, especially if you have higher level roles. If maybe you're an owner or contributor, think about using PIM rather than just walking around day to day with those permissions. Finally, we have resource locks. Now this is not role-based access control, but it enables me to protect resources from accidental modification and or deletion. I can set locks at a subscription level, a resource group or individual resource, and like everything else they are inherited. And I can set a lock as cannot delete, this lets it be modified, but not deleted, or read only, I, I can't change it or delete it. Now this is working at the management plane, i.e. data plane operations are not impacted. If I set a storage account as read only, well, I can still go and change the data, I can delete data. There are different capabilities if I need to protect the data plane. For example, for a regulatory type retention on the data plane, I could use something like immutable blob. That would stop it being modified. Now by default, only owners can lock resources. That's because there's a particular action on the Microsoft authorization resource provider that lets me perform locks. So I would have to have that. And super, super quickly, if I actually go and look at my user, and we'll actually look at this kind of resource group for a second that I was playing with here, we can see I can do locks from the portal and I've got a kind of lock type delete. So I cannot delete this resource group. Now remember, I am a owner of this subscription. I can do anything. So we can kind of test to see if that lock actually works over here. So we'll hit delete resource group. I'm feeling super confident in this lock. It's gonna error when I actually try and hit delete. And there it is, it's locked, I can't delete it. I would have to go and remove the lock before I can delete the resource. So it's just a way to kind of help protect those things. Note, if I use Azure Blueprints, they also have a lock capability they are not using this type of resource lock. They actually use explicit deny assignments to stop me changing resources. So it is not using locking behind the scenes. But locks are super useful to help me protect from some kind of accidental activity on the management plane where I really don't want to. So I hope this was useful. Really this all boils down to the fact that we have these roles that are just there available in Azure. We can add our own. And then I take a role and I assign it to a security principal, a user, a group, an application at a certain scope. Subscription, management group, resource group. And that's how this all functions and comes together. And then things like PIM help me give those permissions just in time only when they're actually needed. If this was useful, please like, comment, subscribe, and until next time, take care.